This call. Assalamualaikum. How y'all doing? Pretty good. That's pretty good. Is everyone uh is everyone here? No, sir. Who's missing? Amaria, she's with mom to go to Walmart and to see her. Boss. Oh. All right. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, one been saying the prayers on a daily basis? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Diane, let me, let me hear you say your prayer, son. Clearly, I have turned myself clean or bright to him who originated in the heavens and the earth, and I am out of the polytheist. Surely my prayer and my sacrifice and my life and my death are all for Allah, Lord of the world. No associate hath he and this am I commanded, and I am of those who submit. O oh, Allah, thou art the king, there is no God but thee. Thou art my Lord and I am thy servant. I have been unjust to myself and I confess my faults. So grant protection against all my faults, but none grant protection against faults with thee. It guide me to the best of morals, but none guide to the best of them but thee. It turn, turns me away from the evil morals with thee. Very good, Dane. Very good. Uh, come on. Let, me, let, me, let Daddy hear you say your prayers. Surely I have turned myself to the upright to the originated the heavens and the earth, and I know the policy. Surely my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death, for all for all the Lord of the world. My associate has here, and this is my commander, and I am the devoted to it. All I have, God, the king, there is no God with me. God, my Lord, and I am my servant. I have been addressing myself when I can first. Because that's my fault. So, grant protection against all my faults. For none grant protection against faults with me, guide me to the best of the world. For none guide to the best of them with me, and turn away from me, the even more of me. Amen. Very good. Very good, Kamal. Uh, Rafi, say your prayers. Truly, I have turned myself, being upright to him who originated the heavens and the earth, and I am not of the polytheist. Truly, my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death. For all for Allah, the Lord of the world. No associate has he, and this is my command, and I am of those who submit. O oh Allah, thou art the king, there is no God but thee. Thou art my Lord, and I am my servant. I have been unjust to myself, and I confess my faults. So grant me protection against all my faults, for none grants protection against faults but thee. And guide me to the best of morals, for none guides to the best of them but thee. And turns away from me the evil morals but thee. Very good. Very good. Um... Hmm. Well, I'd say I should have open, formally opened this meeting, and I will do so at this time. The name of Allah, who appeared and is in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum um, Before I start, I kind of want to just say a word here. Um Part of the uh, one of the motivations or one of the reasons um, that I'm teaching you Sunday school, or what I'm trying to get across to you, is not only uh, the um, 
you know, the, the the truth concerning God, the devil, and yourselves and that kind of thing. But part of, part of the purpose of these meetings is to kind of, you know, prepare you and lay the foundation for the rest of your lives. Do you understand? Yes, sir. What I mean is uh, part of the purpose also that uh, this meeting is being conducted for is to give you what I would like to call balance. Does anyone know or have a off the top of their heads can tell me what is balance? Uh, I know. Um, it's, I think balance is like a Libra. Balance is what? Come on. Like my birth sign is Libra, and I remember it saying it means balance. You said? Did you say Libra? Yes, sir. Are you talking about the the zodiac sign, Libra? No, I'm talking about that, my birth that, sign. That it's not a birth sign. It's a zodiac. I'm not, wait a minute. When when I say what what was your response? Come on, I'm I'm, try, I'm having trouble understanding you. Does that zodiac, the Libra, doesn't it mean balance? Oh, yeah, well, in the zodiac in the zodiac sign, you have the zodiac of Libra, and uh, the the symbol. Uh, for that zodiac sign is, I believe, a, a pair of balances, and I think the word Libra comes from the word liberty or liberal. Okay, so uh, so if you're you, you're saying that balance, yeah, like like the balance of justice, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Homeostasis. Homeostasis. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> That's a that's a very uh, scientific and technical term, you know. That's a I, I guess from a scientific perspective, homeostasis would be a good definition of balance, you know, meaning you know unchanging in some respects. Anyone else? Okay. That's it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's it. Okay. Well, yeah, like I said, you know. Okay, well. So what uh so what uh things am I trying to get you to balance? Well, admittedly, when your father was growing up, you know, and I was around your age and as a young adult, I was unbalanced. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Meaning, as Kamal said, you know, with the symbol of the Libra, the balances in the head, my balances was tilted, meaning. I had a lot more focus on the spiritual side of life and God and that kind of thing than on the the physical side. Do you understand? Yes, sir. And I don't. I, I want you. I want you to be better than me. I, I want you to start. I want you to become. I don't want you to have to go through um, difficulties and uh, unnecessary lessons in life to become balanced. I want. I want to. Um, during, you know, part of these meetings is to help you become balanced children and young men and future adults, okay? So, balance. So, let me get to it. I have, I have not forgotten where we left off last Sunday when I was teaching you on the spiritual side of chess. We're going to get to that in a moment. But, um, when I so balance, simply put, and uh, for purposes of this conversation, this teaching, when I say balance, I'm talking about the spirit, your spiritual side and your physical side. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, um, hmm. physical and spiritual. Physical has everything to do with you can, uh, you know, your five senses, what you can taste, touch, hear, see, and smell. You know, the physical. And the spiritual side has to do with knowledge, wisdom, uh, spirituality. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. You understand? So, uh, uh, but to be a successful person, to be able to navigate uh, through life, you know, and to be have a peaceful, successful life, you must have balance. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Now, uh, our people in this country, well, not so much in this country, black people in general, I would say, around the world, you know, more so than any other group, are more spiritually focused than anybody else. You know, meaning when, you know, uh, black people tend to, uh, you know, 
uh, uh, you know, give a great regard to the spiritual side of things, you know, doing the right thing, you know, be being good, being good people, being courteous, sharing and that kind of thing, you know, uh, having some, having some moral character. Black people are very focused on that. But uh, from my experience, we, our people, when it comes to the physical side of life, uh, not so much. You know, very nonchalant attitude, you know, you know, a lot of it, is, I believe, is due to the teachings of Christianity uh, that our people are given, you know, concerning getting heaven after you die, you know, and, uh, you know, being satisfied with less than the best in the life that you live now. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yet, when they go to church, when they go to different spiritual places on Sunday or whatever day they go, you know, they don't settle uh, for second rate or or they don't consider themselves to settle for the second best understanding of God's word. They consider that their spiritual understanding and their spiritual service to God is, is the best. And they want and they want the best understanding and they want to be as close to God as possible, spiritually speaking. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, that's not balance. Uh I can I I, I will admit to you that I know of no higher goal than to want to be as close as possible to God and to be a completely and utterly righteous person, spiritually speaking. Uh, I, I think that's a, I, I don't know if there's a higher goal than that. But there's a physical side of things. So what am I getting at? When you, you know, um, I believe it's in the theology of time. I, I, I read it or heard I read it in the messenger the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings, when he was like the uh, the saying, there's a saying amongst us Muslims, we say accept your own and be yourself. Well, the question becomes, what is your own? When it says accept your own and be yourself, what does that mean? Uh, do any of you want to try to tell me what does it mean to accept your own? Your own race. The Come universe, again? your own people. Who, who, you who, who, who say who say universe? Rafiq. Very good. That's the answer. The messenger when the when the messenger was asked or when he gave it the understanding of what it means to accept your own, that's in in a word, that's what he said, the universe. Everything that you see. Wait, everything God. Did you say did you say you said home? Sir, did you say home? What do you what do you, what do you mean? Did I say home? I don't understand. You accept your home or accept your own. So, oh, accept your own. The O W N. Accept your own. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so to accept your own means to everything that you see. The the entire universe around you belongs to you. Do you understand? Yes, sir. That means the earth, the stars of heaven, the sun, every everything is yours. So to accept your own and be yourself means, first of all, to accept your own means to recognize and understand that everything is yours. You understand me? Yes, sir. Well, I have a question. I have a question. If if everything in the refrigerator is yours, if everything in your cabinet of food is yours, does it make sense to you to wait to uh eat, you know, if it, to eat something that you have in your own refrigerator or something that you have in your own cabinet, should you wait until it's 3 days old or wait to somebody else open it and eat after them or, or wait for somebody to give you something or, or give you something to hand me down? Or should you be able to get it fresh or whenever you want it? Or, I mean, if it's yours, how how should you regard, for this example, you know, uh, uh, shouldn't you want the best out of your own refrigerator and your cabinet? Yes, yes. yes. Does it make sense to wait for someone else in the house to open a soda pop or open an ice cream when you go in there and open it yourself. Does that make any sense? No, sir. Okay. 
Well, that's why I'm trying to get over to you about life. You know, uh, you don't you don't have to settle. If you want, if you want, there's nothing wrong with having the best and wanting the best. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting a palace or a mansion or owning your own country. There's nothing wrong with that. You you are not somehow getting further away from God because you desire the best of what is in God's house. Do you understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. And as I told you before, what's it? God's house is your house. God, is, Allah is your father. Like I'm your dad or, or your mother. Everything in your father's house is, is yours anyway. So how in the world would some, could somebody consider themselves getting further from Allah or getting further from God when they are just accepting or wanting the best of what belongs to them in the first place? Do you understand? Yes, Balance. Balance. In the book of Revelation, there's a, we're not going to go to it, but, you know, there's something written about that. You know, uh, it says in the days of the seventh angel, the seventh angel is a figure in scripture. He is said to have one foot on land and one foot on water, meaning the physical and the spiritual, a, a man that is balanced. And this, and this, and, 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 and a person, and this man that is balanced, you know, spiritually, from a spiritual perspective, as given in the book Revelation, this this man of balance is going to, you know, end the mystery of God, commence judgment. But the point is, you know, at the even at the end of the judgment of the world, you know, the, the one of the key figures is somebody or a man that is balanced, the man that is successful with God. The man that's that's going to execute God's judgment and, and utterly serve God is a man balanced. Is a man with one foot on land and one foot on the water. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Nothing. So there's nothing wrong with wanting and having the best. You want the bet. You want to serve the, the the best God. You want the best religion. You want the best understanding of the scriptures. There's nothing wrong with having the best spiritually. Well. If that's true, there's nothing wrong with having the best physically. You want the fastest car, the flat, the fastest jet, the biggest house. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. Now, so that being said, let's get back to where we left off last week when we was talking about power. And uh, we were talking about the game of chess. And I intend today to complete this lesson concerning that endeavor, that game. And as I told you before, you know, there's a saying of Muslims, a Muslim does not do anything unless he has a reason to. Now, all the, the many years I played the game of chess, when I was about, you know, Kamal age, Rafiq, you know, when I was y'all age, I was playing a lot of chess. And I was playing tournaments. You know, I was traveling to the suburbs, playing a lot of white children. And ultimately, when I got in high school, became a senior in high school, actually went to Atlanta, Georgia, we flew down there. And played nationally. You know, we we uh, I played I was playing state championships. You know, the last year, my senior year, we came in second. We should have won, but that's that's not the purpose of this conversation. But we uh, came in second in state of the entire state of Michigan. It was a black team of chess players that I was that I was captain of. Came in second place. We should have came in first. That's another story. Then that same year, we flew to Atlanta, and we competed against. All the uh, high schools across the country. We came in 25th. You know, out of the, out of the entire United States, this black uh, team from Detroit that I was the captain of, you know, was 25th in the nation you know, of America playing chess. So I played a lot of chess. And, and throughout those years of playing chess, you know, I was never, I never, I was never given a consideration of the spiritual side of what I was doing. To me, it was just a game. And it was a very fun intellectual game. But I want to put you a little ahead of myself, you know, because, you know, it started dawning on me as I went through life, you know, at a certain point, I kind of start seeing people as chess pieces, you know, meaning that the game of chess kind of uh, became a little real. Not literal. I didn't literally see a pawn and a rook walking down the street, you know. But I'm saying that certain people fit those roles. 
So anyway, uh, so I guess what I'm trying to tell you is I, I understand, you know, my, you, you, you play a lot of games. You play PlayStation. You play a lot of these games. But one game that you played that your dad can relate to that I played extensively is the game of chess. Now, last week I was telling you that, you know, about the queen, you know, about uh, the mark of a defeated or a conquered man that his woman is captured, like a queen on a chessboard. So if you want to know the current state of things or where where you stand as a nation amongst men around the world, you have to look further than the behavior of your of the woman of the of your nation. Okay, so when I say behavior, I'm talking about the culture. So, uh, for example, before I, uh, I kind of I kind of covered this cover what I wanted to cover about the queen, but I'm gonna finish this up and move on to the other pieces. See the uh, the culture of black women. See, the the way the black woman dresses in, in America, the way she talks, the way she basically carries herself is not the way uh, that the black man t- directs her to. It's the way that society under the power and authority of the white man uh, directs her to. The white man has a certain image of, of, of how women should look and how women should act on a television screen. Do you understand? Yes, sir. When you turn on the television, you see women wearing makeup. You do not see women with their head covered. You see women wearing, uh, you know, very suggestive clothing. So not only do you not you see it on the television screen, when you go outside, when you go to Walmart, when you go to school, you see the exact same behavior or actions in real life as far as the way they look and the way they dress. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, the the the, the decisions on how women uh, present themselves publicly, the way they dress, makeup, and 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 the way they look and act, that is being directed under the that that is being that that uh, way of life or the way that they do things is from the point of view from uh, from a European. Caucasian perspective. Do you understand? Do you understand? Yes, sir. What are you doing? I didn't. Are you doing something else besides listening to me? I don't know what Rabi is doing. He's like flipping over a chair or something. There's, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was something under his chair. Well, yeah. Are Are you done? <laughs> Oh, yes, sir. There was an HDMI. That was a chair. That was an HDMI chair. What do you mean, What are you doing? Yeah, uh, there, there was an HDMI cord, like in the chair, and it was, it was bothering me, so I just took it out. But it's it's all good. So anyway, back to the queen. So the one, so the are the 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 uh, the women, or particularly the black women in society, dress and present themselves in a way, you know, uh, that they are basically told to by this society. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay, our women, you know, our and our people for that matter don't refer to themselves as Muslims. And they sure don't on a um, massive or a majority level that our women do not cover themselves and dress modestly. You understand? Yes, sir. Okay, now. Okay. That means that if you, since you are not directing the actions of your woman and another man or another society is, that that shows you the position on this chessboard of life that you're in, that another man is directing the behavior of your queen. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Which means basically your queen is captured, and this is a game that you're not in a winning position. Okay? So 
Uh, I don't want to, so I'm, I want to move quickly through this. So the queen, uh, for the purposes of this conversation concerning the chest, is your woman. Now, let's move on to the bishop. You notice that the bishop uh, moves in an angle on the chessboard. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, he don't move in a straight line. He moves He moves at a diagonal, right? Yes, sir. And you got a dark square bishop and a light square bishop. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, when you think of the word bishop in real life, what is a bishop? Uh, pope? No, wait, no. Like a pope? Uh, I mean, yeah, you could, yeah, I mean, a pope looks like a, a bishop on a chessboard. But who else has something to say? Are bishops on the battlefield? Uh, bishops on the battlefield? You mean? Uh, I'm thinking of like the Catholic Church kind of bishop. Okay, yeah, yeah, a bit, but I, I mean, let me get to the point. Okay. A, a bishop, you find bishops in in churches. A, a bishop is a religious figure. He's a person of. Uh, he's a person. In a religious order with with a certain high rank, do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay, I I don't know a lot about the Catholic hierarchy, but a bishop is someone. He's not just a preacher or a pastor. You know, a bishop is like over a group of other men that that minister the religion. You know, he has some rank, but basically, a bishop is a man that represents himself as a man of the understanding of the word of God, right? Right. Okay, like we there's a black bishop, you may have heard of him in Texas. His name is Bishop T D Jakes, right? right. You, know, I, you, you may not have heard of him. Have you heard of Bishop T D Jakes? No sir. Okay. Well <laughs> believe me it, it, you you get you you don't lose any points for not knowing who that is. But anyway, but Bishop T D Jakes is a is a famous black bishop in America. He's out of Texas. The point is, he's a he, you know he gets you know he's a he's basically a minister of the word. Or he's a Christian minister of the word of God. Correct. I mean, that's what I'm letting you know. You understand? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's talk about the bishop. The bishop. Mm-hmm. Is a religious figure, but let's look at the bishop on the chessboard. The bishop moves in a diagonal, or the bishop moves at angles. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, let's talk about let's let's think about the word of God. Do you know anything that is deeper or heavier than the wisdom and the mysteries of God? No, 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 nothing at all. Okay, so you know, so we say that the word of God is heavy, right? Right. Okay, so let's let's walk with me. When you want to pick up something that's very, very heavy, let's say a boulder or some very, very heavy object, generally, what you would do if you're trying to lift this thing, you would get a very long stick or a pole. You would stick it under the heavy object and try to get leverage. Is that right? Yes, sir. You don't like, you know, stand there and like and try to pick it straight up because it's too heavy. Is that right? Yes, sir. You got you kind of got to get it at an angle to roll it. You know, uh, stick stick some under it and kind of get some leverage. You got to kind of get it at an angle to move it. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, that's what bishops do. A man or a man of with the word the word of God is heavy. Okay? So when you try to understand the word of God or you try to teach the word of God, it is is generally you don't come di you don't come you don't really just come in a direct manner to people because the word of God is heavy, the word of God is bright. And the people don't have the same understanding that you have, so you got to kind of come at them at certain angles, meaning you can't use really big words. you got to, like, you know, talk on their level. You know, like, for instance, when I asked what the word balance means, Rafiq said homeostasis, right? 
Okay. Well, homeostasis is a very uh, direct, uh, uh, straight-to-the-point definition or example of balance. But would you, if I ask you, if I was to teach the word balance, let's say I was teaching 10 million people, right, do you think I would use the word, do you think 10 million people would understand the word homeostasis? No, sir. <laughs> that's 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 too big of a word, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so if you got some heavy lifting to do, you gotta come at people at angles. You gotta use different words. You understand? Yes, sir. Okay, so the bishop on the chessboard moves at angles. So that's how the bishop moves in the real world. He communicates the word of God. He don't really come direct to you, you know. Uh, what, what he studied at the seminary or at the uh, biblical college, he has to come down to you at your level. So he will talk to you at a certain angle, depending on, and you know that an angle is measured in degrees. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, depending on your degree of knowledge will determine at which level of, uh, that a bishop or a man of God will come and talk to you. Because people are at different degrees of understanding or different degrees of education. Is that right? Yes, sir. So if people are at different degrees, it, that means that people are at different angles. And if you want to get to the people, you got to move at a certain angle depending on who you're talking to. Is that right? Yes, sir. Therefore, the bishop moves at an angle, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, on the chessboard, the bishop is, you got a light square bishop and a dark square bishop. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now, have you seen a movie like Star Wars or watched a cowboy movie? Typically speaking, a person on the light side is a good person, and a person on the dark side is a bad person. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. But in the game of chess, you got a light square bishop and a dark square bishop. To the where, where I think Diane and Kamal, when you got a chess, when you're playing chess, is the dark square bishop good, or is the light square? Does it matter? Do you? Is, is, let me slow down. When you when if when you're looking at your dark square bishop and when you're looking at your light square bishop, are either one of them bad? No, sir. Because they both serving your purpose. Is that right? Yes, okay, let's look at the white man. The white man, you got a light square bishop and a dark square bishop. You got, for instance, you got like people like the Ku Klux Klan. They are referred to as the Christian Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And then you got other Christians, you know, uh, the Church of God in Christ, the Baptists. You got, you know, a uh, certain or white folk or white ministers that obviously are racist. You got other white ministers of the Christianity or the white man that's not so racist. Is that right? Yes, sir. Light square and dark square. Is that right? Yes, sir. But to the white man, there he don't care whether that that minister is a dark or white, a dark square bishop or a white square bishop because. Those ministers are serving him because when uh, let's 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 back up for a moment. We were we have been enslaved when we started our third journey in slavery in America for over four hundred years. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now, do you know who the first person basically that the white man sent into Africa before we were enslaved? Can you say that again? You know who the white man sent to Africa before he enslaved us? To Africa? Um, no. Okay, I will tell you. He sent okay. Christian. He sent Christian ministers teaching Christianity to the black man before he enslaved us. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Because in Africa, that we were not Christian. We had different. Uh, Yoruba religion, and we were also Muslim, but we were not Christians in Africa. Do you understand? Yes, sir. 
So the first person he sent in before he enslaved us was his was his ministers. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Then after he sent his missionaries in Africa, he enslaved us. Is that right? Yes, sir. Let's talk about, let's look at America. When the white man first came here to America, who was the first white people that came? They were pilgrims, right? Yes, sir. The Amish, pilgrims. They were good white people, religious white people, right? Yes, Yes, sir. When the Indian first met the white man, he didn't meet the uh, white man in the army. He met pilgrims, the white people that landed on Plymouth Rock, the people with the big hats, the people that sat down at Thanksgiving dinner with him. They were righteous, good, religious white folk, right? Religious, right? Yes, sir. Then after the pilgrims came in, then the white man sent the, uh, his other people in, and they started murdering the Indians. Is that right? Yes, sir. But before the Indians got slaughtered in America, the first white people that the Indians seen was that religious white man, that pilgrim, the Amish, these good white folks. Is that right? Yes, sir. The bishop comes in first at an angle. He don't come to you direct. That bishop, when he came to America, he didn't tell the Indians, look, we want the whole country and we're going to kill you. He didn't say that. He said, brother, let's break bread. Let's have Thanksgiving. Let's share. Right? Yes, sir. And you got Thanksgiving coming up in a couple weeks. And Thanksgiving was a dinner that symbolically symbolizes the betrayal of the white man to the red Indian in America. And they celebrate every year how they tricked the Indian and took America. It's called Thanksgiving, right? Yes, sir. So think about the word Thanksgiving. Thanks is two words. It's a compound word. Thanks and giving. It's, it's a mockery. The white man telling the Indian, thank you for giving us America. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Well, let's get back to that white square bishop and that light square bishop. Let's go back to Africa. So the first people he sent out to Africa was Christian missionaries, good religious white folks, the same white folks that, like, the same game he ran in America, he ran in Africa. Do you understand? Yes, sir. The same game he ran in America and Africa, he ran out in Australia. Do you understand? Yes, sir. He ran the same game all all around the world. When the native darker people first met the white men, they all met good religious white folk. Do you understand? Yes, sir. So let's talk about what happened. In Africa, the white man sent that white square bishop in, that white that that bishop that taught good things. The what the, the 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 bishop. That uh, was very friendly to black people. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Once he sent that bishop in, then he started sending his, his enslavers in Africa, put us on boats, and brought us to America. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then what happened? Guess what happened? When we got to America and we became slaves, we didn't see the light square bishop. The dark square bishop was in America. The dark square bishop was teaching slave obey your master. The dark square bishop was teaching that we were the cursed people of Noah. The dark square bishop was teaching that black people are cursed. The the the, the dark square bishop was teaching that black people are heathens. Do you understand? Yes, sir. See. The white square bishop in Africa taught good things. He said, we want to give you gold if you if you come with us on this trip to America. We're going to treat you like brothers. We are brothers. We're the same people. But when we got on that ship and got to America, we met the dark square bishop who taught in the churches of America that black people at one time, they taught that black people were devils in Utah in the Mormon religion. But in the Christian religion, they taught us that we were born to be slaves because we were heathens. That was the religious teachings of white folks. Do you understand? Yes, sir. The dark square bishop. So, so, uh, 
moment. Excuse me. So, the point I'm making is this. The point I'm making is this. Power. Power. Power is a game. Do you understand? Yes, sir. When I say game, I don't mean a joke. I mean game like a contest. A game like the art of manipulation. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Game meaning the art of deception. Do you understand? Yes, sir. That's what games are. When you play a game, you are hiding your intentions or you hope that your opponent don't know what you're going to do. Or you hope to trick your opponent to gain an advantage over him. Do you understand? Yes, sir. That's what a game is. When you play Risk, when you play Call of Duty, when you play those video games, when you play chess, you are playing a game in which you are trying to hide your intentions to gain an advantage over your opponent. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Listen to me carefully. Power. Power itself in this world is a game. Okay? So... The white man, when he was about to take America, the white man, when he was about to conquer the black man in Africa, the white man, when he he went into Australia and South America and throughout Europe, power is a game. He ran a game to, to achieve an advantage over his opponent. And the white man opponents are the darker people of America, of of the of the earth. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. So in order to deal with the white man, not so much that, but in order to deal with your arch enemy, the devil or white man, and to basically get through our life itself, you must understand the game of power. Do you understand? Yes, sir. You are going to be a, a participant. In the game of power, for the re- whether you like it or not, for the rest of your life, whether it's running your household, raising your children, getting a job, feeding your family, defending yourself, defending your children, it all comes down to power. What do I mean? It takes power to feed your children. It takes power to obtain and maintain and keep a wife. It takes power to have a job, knowledge. The whole thing is power. Do you understand? Yes, sir. So, but back to the point. I am using the game of chess to illustrate to you something about life and your history. So, what I'm making in closing is this. If you're going to partake of a game such as chess, if you're going to spend time doing anything, for instance, playing a game of chess, for example. Get something out of it. Don't let it be something that you just merely waste time on. If you're going to play the game of chess with your brother or sister or whoever, try to get a spiritual understanding of what is this game really talking about or what is it about this game that can truly serve me in my real life. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Because by getting an understanding of this game of chess, if you can understand this game, you can see this white man coming from a mile away, and you can begin to understand how he did or does what he does around the world and to you and me. Do you understand? Yes, sir. So next week we're going to talk about the knight. We're going to talk about the rook and the pawn. But before I close, one moment. Yeah, we could finish here if you want. So would y'all be cool if we finish here? 54? One moment. I'm back. Now, who, who, who's asking me? Who, who's just talking? Her face. Okay, what'd you say? What'd you say, son? 
everyone said they'd be cool if you could finish. Well, if you'd finish here, like with the night they're working the pawn. Oh, you are you are you on Sunday school to continue? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. What about what say you, Dane? You want to hear more? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Well, how about that? <laughs> even even Mr. Excellence wants Sunday school to go on. Okay, well we'll continue. One moment. Okay. All right. So let's talk about let's talk about the night. Okay. One moment. Uh, Daim, how does the knight move on the chessboard? Uh, spaces up and one to the left or right, or two spaces to the right or left, and one up or down. Okay. Wait, so no, wait, no. Knight... Huh? It, it's... Go ahead. Up one over up two up. or up one over one. Yeah. yeah. Direction. Okay, the the, mic, the knight moves in an L shape. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or he moves in like the shape of a seven. Is that right? Yes, sir. What does the number seven represent? Power. Power. Yes, power. Great. Oh, uh-huh. no. Oh, is it is it power? The number six represent power. What does number seven represent? Yeah, knowledge. So, uh, seven rep- seven is a number of perfection. Do you understand? Oh, yes, sir. You know, you got seven days. <laughs> I kind of taught. I kind of taught on this in my other videos that y'all gonna, I guess, eventually get to on YouTube. But you got seven days of the week. Seven colors of the rainbow. Seven notes of the musical scale. You got seven continents. You got you know, seven lights of heaven that you see every day. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, uh, they, you know, the, the, the book says that God created the uh, the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, so you know, se- you know, seven is, is is associated with perfection, or we say seven is, you know, we associate seven as being, a, you know, the number, the number of God. You understand? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. All right. So the night. The knight on the chessboard, he moves in an L position. Okay, so but on the chessboard, well, who would the knight represent? Because let's talk about the knight. On the chessboard, the knight, we know how he moves, but the knight does something on the board that no other piece can do. The knight can appear behind enemy lines, whether if there's an opening or not. Do you understand? Yes, sir. He can he can jump over pieces. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, the if if you have a piece on a chessboard that no matter what the position says, if if if, if a piece on a chessboard can appear behind enemy lines, you know, unlike the other pieces, well, the knight will represent. Uh, loosely, the knight will represent mili- your, your military power. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Your military force. You know, because think about it, you, or, or, or or your special forces of your military. You know, you got like, uh, the you got the people in the army, you got the regular uh, sailors in the Navy, but there's a special unit in the army called the Green Beret. Do you understand? Yes, sir. And in the Navy, there's a special unit called the Navy SEAL. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, when you're dealing with the Navy SEALs or you're dealing with the Green Beret, they not so much, they're on the battlefield, but, you know, they kind of, they're a special force. This, this force, he, they just don't stand on the front, on the line and fire back and forth. These forces are specialists at, you know, getting behind enemy lines and completing the mission. Do you understand? Yes, sir. And they're known as special forces. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's the your knight on the chessboard. The knight would be, you know, like your special forces. So, or your or your military. So in life, 
when we think about the night, actually, if you look at the word night, when you think about uh, uh, a royal court, a king, a queen, a court judge, the knight is a is 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 like is like the right hand man of the king. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Like in the fable of uh of uh like the fable of um King Arthur and the, the knights of the Round Table, you know, or you know, or, or the story of Camelot. You know, King Arthur had twelve knights. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so the knight, so the knight represents your military. Okay, so. So what that, it, so, but, mili, but but when I say military, a military action does not necessarily mean bullets. Do you understand? Yes, sir. A militaristic action could can deal with money. Do you understand? Yes, sir. What do I mean? Check it out. Let's talk about the stock market. Let's talk about a company. And let's say you know what I'm. Uh, I got I got I got trillions and trillions of dollars, and I really want to buy. I really want to uh, do something about Microsoft or Apple. Well, in the business world, there's there's what you would call a. It's called a hostile takeover, meaning you can take somebody's company if you can get a 51 percent share of their stock. Do you understand? Yes, sir. You become a majority owner, right? Yes, sir. Well, in order in order to do that, you have to have you have to be in a special financial position. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. so so the point I'm making is uh, when I when I'm talking about militaristic uh, actions or militaristic figures, it does not necessarily mean a man with a gun. It could be a man with a lot of money. We money. You can look at dollar bills as, as as a form of bullets in the business world. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So so when you so let's so let's bring it back up. Let's let's come back to the day. So when you got uh for example, let me see how can I put this? Hmm. How can we talk about this? Okay, let's look at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay. Let's talk about the the night. That the white men used to get behind the enemy lines of Saudi Arabia. What what happened? Well, when the white man does not come at you with his military, with his navy, his marine corps, his army, he'll come at you, you know, with his businessmen. Whether they be in Saudi Arabia, whether they be in Ecuador, or some other, uh, or Colombia, or some other third world country. If he does not invade, get behind your enemy line, or get in your country with his military, he'll send in his businessmen. What do these businessmen do? Well, they'll go to a country like Chile or Ecuador, and let's say they go to Guatemala, for example. Let's say let's say that the main export of Guatemala is banana. Okay, and you want and you're trying to do business. You're trying to, uh, you, you're trying to exploit the country of Guatemala. Well, how would you exploit the country of Guatemala and not use your military? Well, you would use your 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 fi- your financial men to do it. You can send a businessman down there, and he can get with the upper class. In these third world countries, there's a hierarchy in every society. So if you were in Guatemala, you got the peasants, you got the workers, you got and all the way up to to the elite rich people of any country. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay, so what so what you do when you try to invade a country for its natural resources, you send in your businessman to do deals with the rich or the elite of a country. And what happens is the businessman will make a the the, the, the white man's financial uh military, so to speak, they'll make a deal with the rich people of the country to take their product, but the poor people of that country will suffer. Do you understand? Yes, sir. They'll tell, they'll tell the rich person of this third world country, look, we'll give you uh, millions of dollars. You can, we'll give you all the wealth you want, but sell us these bananas at a half cent per pound, right? Yes, sir. Okay, well, if you're going to get bananas at a half cent per pound, and you're going to give all the money to the rich people of that country. What happens to the rest of the people of the country? They suffer, don't they? 
Yes, yes sir. sir. They don't have that. Okay, so there's a book I read a few years ago. It's called The Confessions of an Economic Hitman. So, but it's by the by, by a white man named John Perkins. But the point I'm making is. He, he, you can, you can, you can uh, influence and overtake a country with money. Okay, so you can, uh, you can exploit a country's uh, resources just by making a contractual deal with the rich people of that country. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, so we talk about getting behind enemy lines. Well, we know one way to get behind enemy lines with the military. Another way to get behind enemy lines is with money. Is that right? Yes, sir. Let's talk about another night, another way to get behind enemy lines. Let's talk about culture. Let's talk about music. Let's talk about television. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Like, you go, like for instance, you could take the – if you're trying to uh, influence or take over a country, you can do it with – with your culture, you can you can start uh, you can uh, try to uh, get your uh, television broadcast or your music broadcast in a country, and if the country allows you to do it, you can put ideas in the people's minds about how they should live their lives through music and through television. Is that right? Yes, sir. For instance, you can go to a country like Iran, where basically all the women are covered up in a basically try to be righteous people. But if you can somehow get behind enemy lines and get get to the people with your music, you can put ideas in the music. Or if you can broadcast certain uh, television shows with certain ideas or, certain, or women acting a certain way through television and music, you can begin to change the minds of the people through culture. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Getting behind enemy lines. Okay, so that's the night. The night is a piece that move a, a, a piece of a, 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 a special piece that can get behind enemy lines. Well, that can be your military with special forces. That can be your your, your very very rich businessman with special finances, or that can be your culture. Do you understand? That that's those are your nights. You understand? Yes, sir. One moment. I'm slightly stuffy. That's why I keep um, holding on. But I'm gonna have to clear my clear my uh, nasal. I'm sorry about that. All right. So let's talk about the rook and what the rook represents. When you when you look at the rook, sometimes the rook uh, by length a, a real chess player wouldn't call a rook a castle, but you know technically you can call it a castle because it kind of looks like one. But a chess player refers to the rook as a rook and not as a castle. Do you understand? Yes, sir. And you notice that the rook, the location of the rook is at the four corners of the chessboard. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you notice that the only piece, the only piece that can cause the king to move two squares is the rook. Do you understand? When the king castles. Is that right? Yes, sir. But at any other time, under any other circumstance, the king only moves one square at a time. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so the rooks are lo- the location of the rooks gives gives a very uh, good hint as to their spiritual significance. The rooks are at the four corners, right? And yes, sir. Something, so the rook is, the rook kind of is like a pillar. Do you, you, know, you ever see a pillar like in front of the uh, like the White House or some of the buildings in Washington? A big long pillar that upholds the the the, the roof of a building. Yes, sir. So a rook is the rook is like a pillar, you know. The, and the location of the rook on the chessboard is at the four corners, you know, like a foundation. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, the rook the rook on the chessboard will represent what what we will call the patriot or the or the true believer in the word of God. Do you understand? Yes, sir. What do I mean? 
a patriot is somebody that's willing to give his life for his country. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, a, a believer in God is someone that believes so well in, in, in the will of God that he lives a, a life of righteousness, and he's also willing to give his life for the word of God. Is that right? Yes, sir. Well, is God the king of the universe? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. In the game of chess, the king only moves one square at a time generally. Is that right? Yes, sir. But when it comes to that rook, when it, when when the rook is in is in direct when there's nothing between the rook and the king, the king will move twice, won't he? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, the rook represent is is a representation of you and me. See, the true believer of God, we don't have any other God before our king, before Allah. We don't serve any other gods but Allah. Do you understand? Yes, sir. There's nothing in between a lot and the in the real believer, the real Muslim. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Now, there's an old saying amongst us Muslims that if you take one step towards a lot, a lot will take two steps towards you. Do you understand? Yes, sir. <laughs> the point I'm making is this: the lesson from the rook is this: when you are a rook. When you are the five, when you are a cornerstone, when you are someone that believes and stands for the word of God, you are special to God. Meaning, when it comes to you, God's going to move quickly towards you for your safety and for your uh, for your aid. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God don't do that. God don't do that for uh, for any other piece on the board but that rook. Do you understand? Yes, sir. So when it comes to you, a lot. There's certain things Allah will only do for you, the believer, that he won't do for no other piece on on the board or on this planet. Do you understand? Yes, sir. And notice, the rook is a piece that holds the line. Just like any believer, the rook stands firm. When the rook gets in the game, he holds the whole line. <laughs> you know, he, well, he moves. And notice, excuse me. And notice that the rook moves straight forward and side to side. He moves in direct lines. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He, he don't move like the bishop. He don't move at no angle. He moves at he moves horizontally and vertically. He moves in straight lines. Is that right? Yes, sir. Like Jesus said, straight is the path that leads to life. <laughs> Pardon me, pardon me. The the point I'm making is that the righteous people, the foundational people of God, they walk the straight path like that rook. Do you understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. And they hold the line. They hold the word of God like that rook. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, that's the symbolism behind the rook. Let's talk about the pawn. <clears throat> okay, colloquially speaking, if you know what that word means, Rafi, what, uh, when we say colloquially, not we're not talking about chess. When we say something, when we call somebody a pawn. Colloquially speaking, what do we, what do we, what do you stand about a person that you call a pawn? You could control them, right? Right. Exactly. If a person is a pawn, that's somebody that's you know that's basically a poor show or somebody that you can control. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. But to talk about the pawn, you know, the pawn has a very unique uh, situation on that chessboard. The chessboard means a whole lot to that. I think the chessboard means more to the pawn than any other piece on the board, including the king. Because when the pawn reaches a certain level on that board, he changes. Is that right? Yes, sir. So let's talk about the chessboard. How many uh, uh, horizontal squares are there on the chessboard? Eighty-four. Wait, eighty-four. I mean, not eighty-four. Sixty-four. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How many? How many? How many squares comprise a row on the board? Oh, eight. How many squares comprise a vertical? Uh, com- uh, a a column on the board? Eight. 
Okay. Now, <clears throat> if there are eight, if there are eight squares in a column vertically and eight squares in a row uh, horizontally, how many squares total do we have on the entire chessboard? Sixty-four. Okay, so the so the chessboard is a perfect square. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Now. Let's move let's move a little forward. Let's talk about the chessboard is composed of 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 of, of, of rows and squares that are composed of eight that's 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 in that's composed of eight squares apiece. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. So let's talk about the number eight. What does the number eight represent? Infinity. Correct. The number eight is the same figure as the infinity when eight lays on the side, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, infinity. Wow, let's talk about that for a moment. What does infinity mean? Never Never, everlasting. Everlasting. Very good, come on. Well, is the truth everlasting? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is the truth infinite? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So... We can we can associate the number eight with truth. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, let's talk about that pawn. Remember, Rafiq told you that a pawn. When we talk about the colloquial, uh, colloquially speaking about a pawn, a pawn is some is somebody that's easily manipulated. Is that right? Yes, sir. Are people very easy to manipulate once they learn the truth? No, sir. If you if you want to become a doctor, what must happen? Years of studying and practice. If you want to become a lawyer, what must happen? Years of studying and practice. Basically, if you want to become anything, you have to learn the truth of that thing. Is that right? Yes, sir. So let's talk about that pawn. Notice. <clears throat> the pawn is like the king in a certain respect because on the on a pawn's very first move it can move two squares, is that right? Yes, sir. And then after that it moves one square, is that right? Yes, yes sir. Kind of kinda of like his father, the king. King moves on his first move, if it if it, if 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 uh if the conditions are correct, it can move two squares and after that it can move one square, is that right? Yes, sir. So, what happens if a pawn, if the if a, if if a, if the opponent's pawn is in front of your pawn? Can your pawn move forward? No, sir. All right. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about that. So, we we know from what what our feet told us that a pawn is a person that's you know can be manipulated or basically a person that's under the authority of power of something or someone else. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Now, on the chessboard, the 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 structure of the pawns kind of determines how the game will be played. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because if you have a very strong uh, pawn structure on one side of the board and a very weak structure pawn structure on the, on the other side of the board, well. If if you the side of the board with a very weak pawn structure probably is going to be where the war is going to be fought on the chessboard. Is that right? Yes, sir. But when the pawns are are, are are have a strong formation, that's the place of safety. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Let's keep moving forward. Now, if an enemy pawn is in front of your pawn, how? How is it possible for your pawn, your pawn under those conditions to move forward? How can it move if somebody's in front of them? It can't. You have to take that pawn. The only way that a pawn can move if something is in front of it is it, it, it must capture at a diagonal. Is that right? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. So when a pawn reaches a certain point on the board and if there's another piece in front of it, it, it 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 cannot move forward. It's stuck, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. And the only way that, that at that point, unless the obstacle unless the obstacle in front of the pawn is moved out the way, the only way that pawn 
going to move again is, is if it only captures at a diagonal. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. What's the other piece on the chessboard besides the queen that moves at, that can move at a diagonal? The bishop. The bishop. Now, who does the bishop represent on the chessboard? The religious. The religious person, right? Yes, sir. Okay, now look at the pawn. We said that a pawn is a person that can be easily manipulated or under the control of somebody else. So on the chessboard, the only way that pawn can move again is only if it captures at a diagonal. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, well, your people... Your people are like pawns on the chessboard. Your people are easily manipulated. And the only way that your people are going to be able to move forward is if they get the word of God in them to move like a bishop. They got to move with the word of God. Do you understand? That's the only way they're going to be able to move in the game board of life. Do you understand? Yes, Yes, sir. Now, if you can keep your people moving forward, and keep them safe from being captured or killed, if you can get them the truth, get them to the eighth rank, if you can teach your people the truth, then that pawn, the, your people that's been manipulated, they will have the power to become anything that they want. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, Once sir. they get knowledge and the truth, that person can become a rook, a knight, a bishop, a queen, any other piece on the board, if it reaches the eighth rank, if you if they learn the truth, is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Well, that will conclude this Sunday school lesson. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, what's up? Do you know when chess was invented? What you say? Do you know when chess was invented? Oh, I. Man, I, I really don't know. I think it was it's you can look it up on lab. I think it was re- invented in Persia about three thousand years ago, if memory serves me correctly. Uh but I think it was invented in Persia about three thousand years ago. If I, if I, I just I don't have it in I, I I looked that up before, but that's the only thing I can recall at the moment. But I believe it was invented in the country of Persia about three thousand years ago. But you, you know, don't you, think I was that I'm sorry? You don't think it was like made before the white people were invented? It could. I, I haven't done enough research to give you an answer. So it probably was probably a lot older than that because it's a very deep game. But I can't answer beyond that. But I, I would, I would surmise, I would guess that yes, yeah, probably, probably was. Right. Anyone else? Jamal, you had a question. Yes, sir. Um. Can you get a basketball for us? I have, I have not forgotten. I'm going to get you a basketball, son. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm listening. Okay. What would it, What would be the likelihood of us saving one of our friends? What? What did you say? What would be the likelihood of us saving one of our friends? Oh, you mean from by uh, from destruction? Yeah. You said saving. Yes, sir. Has the likelihood of it? No. What is the likelihood of us saving our friends? Well, I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of up to them. Uh, you know, if you're trying to you know show someone a teaching of this law, all thing you have to do is take. I've made it very, very easy. You don't have to send them to the library. They ain't got to go to church. All thing they got to do is get on YouTube and go to go and go to uh, the channel, and and they can they can just sit there and listen and be somewhat entertained and learn Islam. You know, that, you know the, the Quran says, um, how does the Quran put it? Uh, a lot, a lot guides whom he pleases. So, if you uh, show them, you know where they can hear the teachings of Islam, and if they like what they hear, 
if Allah okay. pleases them, then they can obtain salvation. But you okay. can't you know you can't make anybody do anything. You know, it you know, uh it has to, you know, and this is the judgment. You know, the people that's gonna to answer your question, the people that will be saved are those to whom the truth is appealing. If the truth of this of Islam as we teach does not appeal to them, there's nothing you can do for them. You know, uh we kinda touched on this when we talked about the spider. Kinda why this world was built. You know, if you're walking along, Rafi, in the field or, you know, outside, and you pass under a tree or walk by a bush, and you see a fly in a spider's web, do you destroy the web to save the fly, or do you just keep walking or watch the spider eat the fly? Uh, I do like both, depending on how I'm feeling. Okay. That's a, that's a fair answer, but you know, typically, morbidly speaking, you know, uh, I can only speak for myself. I mean, probably as a child, I probably would do what you did. But if I'm walking along and a fly just hit a spider web, I will stand there and watch to see how fast that spider can get to that fly. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I'm just being truthful about the matter. The point I'm making is this. This world that you that you the point I'm making is this, Rafi. This world that you are in was set up and built to trap the unrighteous. Do you understand? Yes, sir. But they don't have to be trapped. And the way they did, they are not to be trapped if if they uh they want to be righteous people and love righteousness and love the word of God. But if they're not righteous and they don't love the word of God, this world will trap them. This, would, this, is why, this is why this world is here. So those that will be saved are those upon whom the word of God pleases. If the word of God don't please them and they don't want to hear it, I mean, you can either be sad that they're in that spider web or you can kind of just sit back and watch that spider destroy them. It's up to you. Or you can just keep on walking and not even look at it. But if they're if they're trapped in that web, they're trapped in this world, and they don't want to get out. You can look or not look. The spider gonna destroy them. You understand? Yes, sir. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, sir. One at a time. Uh, when the judgment comes and all the white people are gone, would that be painful, or like would they just disappear? Said, will it be painful, or will they just disappear? Uh, no, no, it's not going to be a magic show. I, I don't know. Ultimately, when they are finally annihilated, I, I don't know exactly how Allah is going to do that. I know some. Of, I know some. I know during the during the destruction, most of them are going to be destroyed. And some of them will be their destruction will be put off for a time. But how they are all finally annihilated, I don't have that knowledge. I just know that Allah is going to do away with them. I don't know what he's going to do. He may mercifully, you know, cause them to sleep. I don't know what he's going to do. But the devil, the devil got to go. There's no doubt about that. They are leaving. Now, how the last one's going to leave, uh, I don't know. I really don't care. I'm just glad that they're leaving. But I, I can't answer that question because I don't know. I just know what I was told by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that some of them, their destruction will be delayed for some years. You know, they'll get credit for trying to be good, righteous people. But uh, ultimately, they will, you know, go. How they will go, I don't know. You know I don't know how that's going to happen. I, I would imagine, if you just want my guess, it will be done in a very merciful manner. I can't imagine a lot, you know, if he, sparing them just to, you know, just to hurt them or something like that. I'm sure it'll be mercifully done. You know, maybe they maybe maybe they won't. Maybe biologically they'll be unable to reproduce and they'll just die of natural old age. I don't know, but they gotta go. So that's that's up to all. if I if if I'm so lucky or fortunate as to meet Master Rahman Muhammad. I don't even know if I ask him because I really don't care. I'm just trying to get to a lot myself and be with him. 
I really don't care what, uh, how he gets rid of him. I'm just glad they're leaving. But I can't answer that question. You know, I would imagine it will be it will I guess the best answer I can give you at this time, it will be merciful, mercifully done by Master Farad Muhammad. Next question. Oh. Uh, we're still gonna have like video games when the destruction's over, right? What? No. We're, we're still saying? gonna have like video games and computers and everything when the destruction's over, right? Son, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's on the other side. I can't answer that. I don't know about computers and what's gonna be on the other side. I, I can't answer. That. I don't know. But the sure. scripture that eyes have not seen nor ears have heard what's on the other side. So I would imagine it would be something greater than what you have now. Next question. That's it. Anyone else? No, sir. All right. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, spending this Sunday evening with you. May Allah bless and keep you all. Uh, I will. Uh, I have not forgotten about your request for your birthday, Kamal. Just give me another week or two. I'll have you. You have your your ball. What not? Okay. If there are no more questions or concerns or statements. I greet you. I came in the name of Master Farad, Mala- Master Farad Muhammad, who is alive and well. I salam alaikum. Well, alaikum salam.